Well, thanks a lot for the introduction. I am Sean Park, and I am actually from. So I'm actually from Australia. Yeah, in fact, I was born in South Korea, but I, you know, live in Australia, and I'm an a Australian citizen at the moment. So, just in case that you wanted to know. Um, so, the topic that I'm going to talk about today is neural blacklist. So, the world has uh, uh, changed ever since the dawn of the um, computer, and the world has even more, more changed uh, ever since we've got the invention of the internet. And now, if the world is going to uh, go through even more uh, dramatic uh, transformation because of the artificial intelligence. So, for example, you know, we've got uh, a deep learning, you know, uh, techniques that can uh, translate the uh, uh, Chinese characters in the picture into the English picture. So that's all implemented in the using deep learning. Um, also, using deep learning, you can you recognize the objects in the video, the persons, the motorbike, the tie, and chair. And even, uh, you know, we get frustrated by the AlphaGo, you know, as a, t as a as a top player in the, in the game of Go, you get defeated by the machine. Um, and, and these days, you know, we got something called uh, StarCraft II, uh, which is a video game. Um, and uh, who knows that, you know, one day, you know, the machine, you know, can uh, defeat uh, the human uh, players. So, yeah, so the whole thing, you know, is about deep learning and artificial intelligence. But so the question is, how can we use that sort of a, you know, a cutting edge technology into our security problems? Um, so I have been working on a lot of those um, AI projects up until now. And so this is the topic that I'm going to uh, talk about. And, uh, and, and that's, you know, it's only one of those uh, projects that I'm working on at the moment. It's called uh, uh, Neural Blacklist. So, um, in the old days, in the old days, we, we used to, you know, you know get the calls you know, from uh, someone, uh, you know, from your uh, colleagues, or you just, you know, you know, get some information about the outbreak of the malware in the websites uh, and things like that. And you just manually enter the in details of the uh, 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 malicious URLs into the blacklist, uh, so that way you can you know, just block them, you know, from being accessed. Um, and as you know, you know, the malicious URLs are you know, one of the major uh, threats in the security world because uh, in the in the malware campaigns, you've got you know, infection uh, chains. You've got uh, at the beginning, you will be infected by ex by simply accessing the uh, initial infection site, and you, once your computer gets compromised, uh, you know the malware will be accessing the uh, drop site and the CNCs and the payment sites, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it, it's it's very important. It's it's very important to actually you know block and detect detect and block those uh, malicious websites. But but today, things have changed a lot. So, in the past, you know, the volume of the URLs and the style of the URLs were very manageable. We, can, we could do that manually, fully manually, using your intelligence and your fingers uh, on the keyboard, right? But these days, you know, we've got a bunch of those malwares, and we've got too many URLs. We've got too many automatically generated uh, URLs, just like that. So uh, it will be humanly impossible, actually, to you know add all of them into your, your blacklist, really. Uh, and besides that, you know what what you are seeing is only just a just a half of it's not half actually it's only in tip of the whole you know volume of the URLs you know that that malware can um, uh, generate. 
So even though, so what that means is, even though you actually have added all of them in your blacklist, it may not be you know, perfect because it, uh, tomorrow morning, you know, the malware may access other website, sorry, other URLs, which is also, you know, automatically generated. So how can we handle that? Um, uh, yeah, before we you know, go straight to the solution, let's have a look at each one of those um, a really, you know, they're tricky URLs. So, for example, you know, the crypto locker is one of those, um, w w was one of the major threats, and I think it still is. Um, and if you have a look at the URL uh, pattern, there you've got the initial domain name, slash, and you've got the random folder name. Uh, we've got another random file name, dot PHP, question mark, ID equals a uh, person's email address. Uh, and the person's email address is uh, usually in the format of the first name, dot last name, at etc. So, um, and it's, it's hard to detect the kind of um, URL pattern automatically or, you know, even using your um, our regular expressions. It's very hard because we've got, you know, the random um, names in there. Another one that has been really popular uh, this year is Loki. Loki is also just another uh, ransomware. Um, Loki version 2 is using something uh, like that. So the format of the URL is, looks you know, pretty much like a DJ, you know, the uh, domain generation algorithm. So it, you know, the way it works is just like this. You know, the malware has got its own algorithm embedded uh, inside. So every day, it, you know, it automatically uh, generates a new name, a set of new names, uh, different names like that. And at some point later, you know, when the attacker decides uh, to activate the attack, you know, I mean, before then, you know, all, all those names will not be uh, resolved if you, you know, put a, a DNS request on those domain names. But at some point when the attack activates the uh, domain you know, by simply uh, registering an IP address uh, associated with that, then it, it will get activated and, you know, the attack will actually, uh, you know, be you know, further initiated. So, and this idea of the uh, DJA, so because, you know, using the algorithm, we, you can, you know, uh, generate like, you know, billions, it's not, um, if, if you can, you know, uh, generate millions of those uh, URLs, or it can be, you know, billions of URLs, who knows. And it's just uh, simply impossible, or um, even, even though if it's you know possible to add all those names in your blacklist, blacklist, it's just uh, you know just waste of space essentially because you know all those domain names are not are not active um, most of the time, so it is just really pointless. Um, and also we've got. Uh, <laughs> A rig exploit kit that has been really, uh, really, you know, uh, gaining the, the uh, attraction early this year, and it has been really uh, successful in the attacks. And it was um, delivering the server uh, ransomware as a payload. And I think also it has the capability to actually you know, to deliver the other types of malware as well. Um, so if you have a look at the format of the URLs, it's using for accessing its um, a payment side, it looks like that. So it's got, again, it looks, appears that it, it is a, a DJ name. Uh, in, th in this case, we've got some numbers uh, in the domain names as well. So, I mean, how can we add you know, that sort of stuff? I mean, how can we detect the, the URLs like that? That's the main problem. So, I mean, as a human being, we, we are very, intelligent species, right? And uh, by simply looking at the your pattern like that, we don't have, we, we need only a few of those examples. And we can automatically identify whether this particular URL is a rig EK uh, URL or the Loki URLs. We can automatically, you know, identify it really accurately. So how can we, how can we actually, you know, achieve that? 
uh, by using the machine. So, right, so I mean, to uh, summarize, you know, the problems, uh, we're living in the sea of the URLs every day, and how can we identify these, these URLs automatically? So in the past, uh, people have been using a few of those machine learning approaches, like a you know, support vector machine, random forest, and uh, lately, you know, XGBoost. Um, so if you have a look at the code up there, uh, on the top, uh, you've got yeah, three sections there. At the top section, we we just uh, a couple of lines of code to uh, read in the uh, data set, and in the middle section, you've got the uh, training function invocation, and at and at the bottom, you're simply you know, you're doing the uh, prediction. It's just only a few lines of code. Yeah. Anybody can do that, right? Even if you don't have any experience in the machine learning field, if you really understand the whole concept, you can do that easily. And um, yeah, the way it works, it doesn't matter whether you're using XGBoost, SVM, or Hermann Forest. The idea is that the input is going to be some sort of a, a, a tabular data structure. So you've got the fields like, you know, for example, you know, some fields, you know, the frequency of some um, alphabet A, frequency of alphabet B, frequency of alphabet C, and things like that. So you just uh, create your own features. Or alternatively, you can simply use um, n-grams, you know, a unigram, a bigram. So what, what it simply means is just uh, the statistic, I mean, you know, the frequency of uh, some numbers in the URL. So you can use that sort of approach as well. In fact, if you've got experience in the machine learning space, you almost always use um, n-gram approach because it's easy to apply and it, it has been used a lot in the past and, and there has been a lot of uh, success stories uh, reported as well. So, and, and that's part of the reason why you use n-gram models. Um, and if you, uh, so after the uh, training, you will be able to see the uh, decision tree, you know, uh, built up internally inside the algorithm, and it will be looking like that. So you will simply, for each features in the input vector, uh, you simply, do, so depending on the, uh, the value in the input vector, you will get, if else, this one, if else, that branch, if else, that branch, right? So it's just a uh, simple uh, stuff like that. So it's pretty easy to understand. However, um, the, the main reasons why it has been used so, so well and a lot by the uh, uh, engineers is because it's easy to program, in my view, and it's uh, very fast when you're doing the training, um, and it's also very good if the input feature is, is well defined. I mean, input feature actually makes sense if if, if input feature makes sense. Um, and also it's fun because you're using your brain, human intelligence. Uh, you know, I want to implement, you know, some fantastic feature like this. Uh, you know, yeah, I want to do this, I want to do that. You can use your, you can you know, meet your um, uh, programming, you know, desire, I guess, <laughs> in my view. Well, I'm not saying that it's an entire a failure, but what I'm saying is, um, uh, it, it, it has flaws in it, and I've you know, just summarized you know, a few of those you know, flaws uh, at the bottom, but I mean the, the main thing is, how about this, okay, so I've spent you know, a few days to implement a feature, you know, set of features, sorry, I, in fact initially I, I tried Ngram model uh, at the beginning on, on, the, on the URLs, and it seems like it's working, it's achieving like, you know, uh, you know, just 80% accuracy, for example, right? And uh, you know, it's not enough, so you try your own own features, you invent your own features, some sort of, you know, for example, how many uh, uh, slashes you've got in the URLs, for example, right? And and you can increase the, you know, accuracy on top of, uh, on top of that, too. So, um, 
it, it may increase the accuracy, uh, but it, it's not really, you know, nowhere near the, you know, a perfect accuracy. So, and the bigger problem, the the only the only single biggest problem uh, in that approach using XGBoost, SVN, Random Forest is, okay, the features I have invented is working for this particular URL types. And the next day, you've got a new you know, malware campaign, a, a new you know, family has appeared, and they're using a completely different URL pattern. And your feature does not work. So in that case, you have to spend you know, another few days to invent another features. Are you going to do that? I wouldn't do that. So that's major uh, motivation for uh, deep learning. Uh, deep learning is, you know, has been inspired by the human brains, of course, and uh, it, it has it has neural network. You've got the neurons and the activations and the weights, uh, synapses, and usually we've got the input layer on the left hand side. We've got the upper layer on the right hand side, and also we've got the uh, multiple hidden layers in, in the middle. Things like that, and of course the major, you know, the core uh, ingredients of the neural network is the um, nonlinear activation against the weighted sum on the inputs. So I'm going to give you just a bit of a, a quick demo on the results. Sorry, on the on the training and the results first, and I'm going to move on. Got 33 minutes left. So the training. Um, I'll show you. Well, can you read it at the back, actually? Is it too small? I will make it a little bit bigger for you guys. Hopefully you can read that. Okay. So I'm using basically a TensorFlow. Uh, and as you can see there, you've got the Epoch, at each epoch, you, you can see that, you know, the cost, uh, it is going down. No, actually, actually, it's not going down. I don't know why. But I mean, it will it, it, uh, fluctuate uh, sometimes, but it, it will eventually uh, drop. So, and also the uh, mini batch accuracy will, uh, will increase over time as well. Um, I have um, got 100 pucks. 100 pucks, so we can we can wait until it will be finished. It, it, the patience is the virtue in this world, in the machine learning space. You have to learn to wait first to you know, get the results, right? Um, but anyway, I'm going to stop right now because I'm not going to wait. Um, just stop right there. And uh, yeah, I'll come back later. Um, so I'm using the a trained model. And so I've got you know the, the URLs. Um, actually, I need to show you what the URLs look like first. Uh, URLs um, is right there. That one, yeah. So it will look like that. again. It's pretty small. So it will look like that. You got you know a few of those. So 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 we have no idea. We got like you know millions of those URLs incoming in Echo Myolog every day. If it's not billions, right? And uh, how do you know? How do you know? I mean, you know, it's just too many URLs out there. So um, if you just run the um, uh, a trained model, you can see uh, that it has the capability to detect all those hard to detect uh, URLs. Let's wait. There you go. It's just a you know, few of those samples there. So you can see that you know, in the green, sorry, in the in the yellow. 
Oops. And up. Okay. In the yellow, it uh, has detected the crypto locker URL. As you can see, it's obviously the uh, URL from the crypto, crypto locker. And in cyan, in green or blue, um, you've got the Loki URLs, which is the uh, uh, DJ URL. In red, you've got the server uh, payment site uh, URLs. So, yeah, that's what they can, do. you know, that's what the deep learning is able to do. Okay, let's get back to our slides. So, I have used uh, something called RNN, the recurrent neural network. So it has one single cell, single uh, memory cell. Just imagine yourself, you're a human being, right? You, you, your brain, you think uh, over the time. We have got in four dimensions. We've got X, Y, Z, and, and the time. So we, we uh, have got a new um, you know, perception of your world. And, and each, at each uh, time step, you get new inputs. Right? You've got a new person incoming, you, I, you've got a, a person leaving. So each time you get some sort of new piece of information. But at the same time, you know, the whole thing, you, you've got, you maintain the uh, memory image, essentially. And that's the whole, whole idea that RNN is exploding. So you've got a, a single cell and the weight will be simply updated. So um, so when you say, uh, you know, um, I'm training a, a neural network. Well, what it means, really, is uh, simply updating the weights, updating the weights between the neurons in such a way that it will you know, give you the uh, right results. So if you just unroll that cell, it will be looking like this. So at each uh, a time step, your uh, memory state, uh, memory cell state will be updated you know, based on the uh, previous memory state and the, and the new input at that uh, step. And at the end, uh, you want to get the answer. Well, so you, uh, you have seen x, y, z, dot, com, dot, t, w. What would be your, your answer, right? And, and that's the model that we've got. Um, so if you just uh, you know, zoom in uh, you know, between the cells, it will be looking like that. So, you, so as I mentioned before, it, it has weights between the cells, uh, and the cell, sorry, the weights uh, will be just reused uh, over time. Um, and also, we uh, typically uh, use um, hyperbolic uh, tangent function as a nonlinear activation function. But if you, if you simply do the weighted sum uh, between uh, the input vector against the, the weight, it, it's not, it doesn't have the uh, nonlinearity in there, which actually is is quite a bad thing uh, in making the correct decisions in the long in the longer term. So and that's the reason why we always uh, apply the activation function, some sort of nonlinear activation function. And uh, for for RNA, we use a tangent function. That I'm going to explain about the you know our characteristic of that uh, activation function later. Um, so if you if you have a look at that particular uh, yeah, state at the final state, right? And and it, the things we want to you know, get the answer, right? So we've got the memory states. The memory cell uh, has you know uh, neurons in it, and we want to convert that into the answer. What is the answer that we want to get? We the answer we want to get is whether it is a a, a clean URL. Or uh, a crypto locker URL, locky URL, or a server URL, right? So we've got the labels, right? So we've got zero, one, two, three. We just simply assign the numbers for each one of those uh, yeah, uh, patterns of the uh, patterns of the URL. Um, so how would you do it? How would you, you know, just convert the, um, you know, because uh, for example, you know the. The number of the neurons that we've got in the cell is is usually you know, bigger than the number of the classes that we want to uh, classify, right? So we simply have a you know, fully connected um, a layer between the memory cell and to the number of the neurons that 
which is equivalent, which is the same as the number of the classes that we want to get, right? So we've got you know four classes there. We've got four neurons up there uh, after the fully connected layer, and um, after that we just apply the softmax layer. So what that is is because uh, uh, sorry, here the output of those four neurons will be some you know arbitrary numbers, and what we want to get is we want to have get the you know the probabilities of 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 each class, you know, you know what, if if you if for a given URL, what is the probability of this URL being a clean URL or a crypto locker, right? So we simply apply the uh, information uh, theoretic uh, probabilities, and some people ask why I using something called something more complex. Uh, He's like softmax instead of using a a normalized you know, sum and you know average and you know stuff like that. Uh, the reason for that is that it has got some information theory being embedded in it. So uh, the more error that you've got, um, it will be the the uh, probability it will be you know a lot you know, just lower and and a bit you know, just higher. Uh, um, Value at the input, it will actually, you know, you push the uh, 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 the probability a lot higher. So it is just a a nonlinear um, um, uh, transformation, right? So after that, we get the actual uh, probabilities of each level being accurate. So clean 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, and 0 0.6. So in the case, will be the it will be the server uh, URL, right? And okay, so we have got the architecture of, of the model, um, and but how can we do the training? Um, we ha we're using something called uh, you know back propagation. Back propagation uh, has been around for a long time. You know, <laughs> that's not a new idea. It's simply um, computes the error, which is the difference between the label and the, and the uh, desired output. Um, and then we simply ask at each layers, you know, whether, which, whether these particular um, activations are actually affecting the um, error or not. And after that, we just you know go back again one step further, and we just uh, see whether a particular weight is affecting the, the, the activations of the activations of the neurons or not, and, and so on. So it's so it simply you know uh, goes back all the way to the um, input layer. Um, so we got something. <laughs> so, I mean, so until uh, up until now, it looks like. Everything is fantastic. We can simply apply RNN, and we get the answer. Um, unfortunately, you know, um, as the number of steps increases, um, you you know just forget, right? So I remember some stuff that actually happened yesterday, very clearly. Uh, in about a week time, yeah, I may recall that a little bit. You know, that happened about a week ago. Yeah, but in about a year. Time, you know, I mean, uh, you know, remember anything, right? So, it just happens here again uh, in the in the neural network as well. So, so it's called you know the uh, vanishing gradient problem. So, the the main uh, issue is that um, if you have a look at the uh, activations uh, in between the cells, there, the red line there is hyperbolic. A tangent function, so it has the y range of minus one to one. So depending on the already sums input, it will just output either minus one or zero point sorry minus uh, zero point eight zero or minus uh, zero point sorry zero point three or one etc. Right. Um. So in the way the you know, back propagation through time works is it sees the gradient at each uh, time step, and if it 
if the slope uh, is small, small, then it will actually, you know, uh, correct the weights very slowly. Just assuming, because the hyperbolic tangent function uh, will actually, will not actually reach number one or minus one, it will go infinitely, right? So if, you, if your neuron is uh, saturated, uh, which means y your uh, activation uh, will actually, uh, the output of that uh, hyperbolic tangent function will be far, far away uh, to the right, then it will be hard to, you know, make a, hard to make a correction all the way back because the, the slope, the, um, the a gradient will become really small. It's really small, so it takes a long, long time to get all the way back. So it's called the, a vanishing gradient problem. So to, to just address that, um, um, you know, people have uh, invented something called long short memory. So it simply, you know, has got some sort of you know, just gates like you know, in, uh, in, in the circuits, in the computer circuits, for example, you've got, you know, AND gate, XOR gate, OR gate, NAND gate, things like that, right? And uh, so we just, you know, um, devise the, the cell in such a way that when the back propagation happens, it will, you know, just memorize the stuff or it will, you know, f it, uh, forget stuff. So for long short term memory, we've got uh, three gates. You've got the F, F is the forget gate. You use the update gate, R, R is the reset gate. Um, and you know, one single, yeah, I mean, it, it, there are a lot of um, uh, variants um, on LSTM and you know, one of the optimization, optimizations that uh, other people actually made is called uh, GRU. It, has, it uses only two gates, but still has the same effect as LSTM. Um, and on top of that, I mean, so uh, using uh, GRU, I have achieved up until like 98% uh, accuracy, believe it or not. <laughs> um, I'll give you the results, you know, uh, later, uh, after a few slides anyway. Uh, so I was thinking to, you know, improve the accuracy and I uh, was, you know, uh, looking at the, the a paper, uh, which is at the bottom of the slide, and it was using something called a tension mechanism. So the, the idea is simple. If you have a look at the picture, on the right-hand side, uh, it's, it is the mapping between the French uh, sentence and the English sentence. So as you can see there, the activation, activations are actually uh, dependent on different uh, characters. So if you look at every single one of them at the input, you may not have the accurate result. If, if, but if you are you know, focusing on some specific uh, uh, characters, then you will get you know, more accurate uh, translation. And that was the idea that it, you know, the person actually uh, has researched on. So I have applied that. I'm sorry. Ooh. <laughs> And uh, it, it actually has, it has increased the accuracy a lot too. So, um, so, it, so, it look, so it looks like you know, everything is, is perfect until now, but uh, you know, I realized that you know, I, I realized something really important. Um, and because of that, I could not really you know, achieve, the, achieve the accuracy that I wanted to have. So it's called something called embedding. So if you ever look at the, you know, all the successes of the deep learning, um, the, what they have in common is the input is, has a, a, you know, just a flow, a smooth, continuous values. For example, images like this. Images like this um, has, if you have a look at each pixels, and if you have a look at the other picture that will uh, look very similar to that, the uh, distribution of the pixels in the input space are almost identical. One, well, they're not identical, but they're very similar to each other, right? So the input is very smooth. But the problem we've got is we've got the URLs, the number of uh, yeah, characters as an input. So um, 
each individual, the pixels have meanings. We can, you know, find the differences and find similarities between the pixels. But the symbols, what is the, what's the similarity between uh, alphabet C and alphabet A? Well, there's no similarity. <laughs> and what's the difference between alphabet A and D? It, it has no meanings uh, in, 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 in its own form as, as a symbol, right? So what we want to do is we want to have, we want to learn the uh, our representations of the each input input element and the input vector uh, by using something called embedding. We just uh, assign uh, numbers uh, numbers for each uh, input, each, each possible input uh, symbol. So it's called embedding. Uh, so with all of that, we got so we got a RNN, a GRU, attention, and embedding. The final architecture is that. So, the, so that's the architecture I actually have used uh, in my research. And I'm going to explain the hyperparameters of that. So I've used only two, uh, two layers. So what well, you might wonder, oh, can you actually do that? So we've got you know just one single um, you know layer, um, but uh, by simply you know feeding the output of the uh, previous layer to the input of the next layer, you can have a more uh, you know, high level understanding of the input state, sorry, understanding of the uh, memory state. So I have used uh, two layers, uh, and of course, of course I've got the embedding layer, and uh, also I'm using the, something called uh, bucketing, uh, because uh, some of you all are very short, some of you all are very long, and if you simply you know, apply the padding on a, a small URL, a short URL, uh, you know, the, it will take ages. It will take ages to you know to do to do the training. Um, so I have used uh, simply you know put you know the the, the small URLs into one bucket, uh, and I've got the long URLs in another bucket. So that way we can you know, do the training more efficiently. And also the cell uh, the cell type I used was GRU, and the number of classes I've got is four. So I've I've used only four types of URL. Uh, in this experiment, so we've got the clean uh, URL, uh, crypto locker, lucky, and server rig AK, uh, and the number of he number of hidden units I used in the memory cell is just only just only 64. So let's uh, and people are asking, okay, so you have been you know talking about deep learning, and so what is the feature? What is the input? What does the input look like? And that's the answer. Um, the, uh, the biggest beauty I actually think uh, for deep learning against the old style machine learning is we don't, we don't need to do the feature engineering. We don't have to spend hours and hours or days and days to find out what the right feature would be to, make, to achieve your goal. So the input is going to be just the uh, URL characters. So of course, you know the, the machine is not really understanding the alphabets, so it will understand the numbers. So we simply you know, just convert the uh, uh, the input URL to its uh, um, number, right? So, <laughs> and that's the input. Um, and the data set I I have used is uh, I've used all were sourced from either uh, Akamai Log or our um, mail operations team, or the ransom record tracker. So, and I've used a very small percentage of, of the samples for the training. Uh, I've used only you know, just 10%, 10% of all the URLs. So it's, it's, I've got about 40,000 40, URLs in total. I've used only 10% of that. Uh, for training. Okay, here we go. So we got the demo now. I think that's something uh, that might that might inspire you guys if you haven't got any experience in deep learning. Um, show you that. Okay, going to start. Okay, so this is the uh, a Tisney uh, visualization. So what that does is, so I'm just visualizing the hidden state, the, 
the last memory state of each sample. So each, each dot here is representing one single, each, single, each sample. And because the, the number of neurons I've got is uh, 64, and I want to visualize on the 2D screen, so uh, what, what Disney does is uh, reduce the dimension from 62 to only two dimensions. And the colors are the actual uh, labels, the actual labels of each sample. So the idea is uh, to, uh, to be convinced that your algorithm is actually working, you want to see clear separation between each class. So can you see, oops, sorry about that. Can you see the clear separation here or not? If you can see, give me a, oh, give me a clap, please. <laughs> So the, the blue dots here are just the uh, clean URLs, um, and, the, and the red ones are, what is the name of that? Let's have a look. So I think that's the lucky predicted name. Okay, in this case, the, the orange ones. I'm oh, sorry, sorry about that. Um, predicted name, yeah? Okay, so that's lucky. I'll just go back to the label version, okay? Yeah, the red one is, is Loki, um, and the purple ones, the purple ones on the right-hand side is server reggae, reggae K, um, and we've got the crypto locker there. And you can see the actual URLs of that too, yeah. Um, and that is the visualization for the training set, right? So what we're interested in is whether it will actually work on, on, you know, on the real data set, right? So I have, uh, you know, uh, a put aside a validation set, which is not, sorry. Okay. okay, let's have a look at that. Which does not overlap, overlap with the a training set, okay? Let's have a look at that, just one more time. So, so I mean, the fact, the fact that, um, the fact that, you know, the points here are, you know, just clustered, uh, is not sufficient. It's not sufficient to. It's not sufficient to uh, you know to convince your uh, friends that your algorithm is working. But it is necessary to actually see that you know uh, the labels, or all the all the points with the same label, you know, should you know do the cluster. Uh, it should be clustered. Okay. Okay. So it, it is also working well on, on the validation set, too. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on to the next slide. So if, if you have a look at the activations, activations of the, uh, each neuron, each neuron along the timeline. So here, I couldn't actually put that, the, the meaning of that picture there. So the, uh, the vertical line, it, is the time step, so at the and 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 the horizontal line is the each each neuron. I've got sixty four neurons there, so you can see the, the each each row in the picture means just one single step, and each single step has got uh, sixty four neurons in the row, right? And along the timeline. Right, because some URLs are short, some some URLs are long, and that's the reason why you know the height of the picture is different here, because uh, it, it, each picture here is is representing a different URL. So um, before the training, you can see that the picture in the activations it looks like it's pretty much random. The activation is pretty much random, but after the training, you can see as you move. Uh, towards the end of the 
uh, time steps, in which is the bottom, you can see in a more clear a pattern, right? So that you can make a make a correct decision. So, for example, you know these two samples, these two samples have you know very similar patterns, and in, indeed these two are the, the you know in this, in these two belong to the same um, a class of the URL. So, because you can see that you know two in you know, a big a white line on the left hand side, and after that in the middle we've got you know two big you know just black black lines there. So that way you can actually see, well, it, it's actually, it may not mean too much to you guys, but I mean, you, you really want to see, you really want to see whether your algorithm is learning something or not, right? And that's the reason why I've got the, the visualization. And that's another example. Um, and also, I wanted to know in whether, you know, I can visualize the attention. I mean, what sort of are characters in the URL that you are paying attention to? For uh, to make a decision, so it doesn't matter whether the actual you know decision uh, is a clean URL or a, a crypto like URL. What, what are the what are the characters in the URL that actually affected the decision? And if you have a look at the you know a vivid black characters there, so <laughs> these are the ones. So for example, in the in the in the highlighted uh, URL at the top, you can see it's a a crypto locker URL, and it actually was paying attention to the a random folder name, and uh, sorry, I can't see that here, <laughs> um, and also the random file name followed by question mark PHP. Um, and some of those uh, email address portion as well. So the accuracy uh, is looking like that uh, on the left hand side of the graph. And the loss is uh, dropping continuously and looking like that. Okay, so what's the result? So I have I trained the model you know, for about an hour or so and uh, I've got about 99.92% uh, accuracy. But after that, I you know, ran again, uh, well, this time a bit longer. <laughs> I think it was just about an hour and a half or something like that. And um, I've got 100% on the validation set, right? So, well, so what does it mean? Is it a perfect algorithm? Perfect algorithm? No, I don't think so. <laughs> so, yeah, there's one thing uh, in in the earlier training. You know, I was identifying in what was the URL. You know, that was uh, causing the um, uh, uh, first negative, first negative. So that particular long URL was in the test set of the crypto locker. So it should be detected as a, a crypto locker, but the model was not detecting it. Um, but in fact, if you have a look at the URL structure, it, it, you know, it's not a, a crypto locker URL, URL pattern. So <laughs> the reason why I put that URL in the test set uh, is because I've got you know, that sort of a URL set from the operations team. And I you know, simply you know, blindly put the URLs in the test set. So, so in fact, it was a, a, a human mistake. Human mistake. So that URL should not be in that in that file. So, so what that means is that you can even do the you know, debugging. It, it just tells you the model is telling you what you've done wrong. So it's really scary. Um, so so each time you've got a new a, a pattern of URLs, all you have to do is simply add one more folder in that structure and add the list of URLs that you want to detect. And you know, put a name and the label, and that's pretty much it. So it's just as simple as, as that to, you know, do, uh, to do the training each time. So you don't have to do the you know, really you know, painful uh, 
a feature engineering every time. So, and that's it. Any questions? Thank非常谢谢双Park的精彩演讲,那有没有人对于刚刚的内容有任何问题? Okay, there's one question. Yeah. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Left hand side. Um, uh, I'd like to ask, um, so for the embeddings, did you use uh, like character level embeddings or word level embeddings? Uh, just a simple, uh, simple, um, it, it, it's a very simple one line of coding. I'm using uh, TensorFlow. It's simply, um, I'm using uh, embedding lookup. So you just simply define in the weight, not the weight, you know, the actual embedding, which is the, you know, which is a, a set of numbers. So I'm going to sh show you the code briefly. Um, well, I'm not showing the entire code for, or, you know, the because of the uh, copyright issue, I guess. Um, so here, so that's one line. It's hard to see. I'm going to copy that. Oops. Just make. So that's the line there. So it's I simply, you know, it defined a variable, um, you know, that um, connects. Sorry, it, you know, for for each neuron, uh, you know, I, I have to define a variable, a tensor variable there, and simply, you know, do a lookup operation there. So it just requires it's only two lines. Um, sorry, because I'm not that familiar with uh, TensorFlow. Um, uh, could you just tell me, like, whether, uh, like, one individual token is it like a character or a word or a phrase? So, so, what I'm doing is just mapping one character to uh, a 64 um, numbers, and that's it. Mm, right, I see. Um, so. For for this model, were you able to locate like um, which particular features or like combinations of characters um, were like dead giveaways that this URL um, was malicious? Uh, did you find any such important features? Well, can you say that again? Sorry. Uh, were you able to find any features like maybe combinations of characters that were really important for the model to find uh, whether a URL was bad or good? Uh, well, I'm not fully understanding you know, the question here, but, uh, but I think you know, what you're asking is just uh, you know, what you know, are the features that actually you know, the model is learning? Uh, I mean, is that right? Uh, were you able to find any particular features that were very important for the model to decide whether the URL is a bad one or oh, a good yeah, one? Oh, yeah, I understand. I understand that. Okay, so you, you can give it a try too. I mean, if you've got your own features, right? You can, you, you, your own features, right? At the input, right? Uh, you can give it a try, but the main idea of the deep learning is that, you know, do not use your brain. Do not use your brain. You do not use your intelligence. Just uh, let the model you figure it out itself, itself. So we just feed the original raw input as much as possible. So that way we, we are not actually missing any some important features we might miss, and that was the you know the model of the uh, deep learning all the time. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to just ask uh, one final question. Um, did you try your model on uh, maybe another data set? Um, I'm curious to see if your model parameters are transferable. RNN is 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 one of the models that uh, you can use in uh, uh, deep learning. We got. The uh, CNN, RNN, uh, a bunch of other models as well. Um, so one of the beauties of the deep learning is that we, if, once you've got your your working model, it, it can be applied. I mean, assuming that the input domain, the the you know, just characteristics of the input domain is very similar, then simply you can use the same code on the other data set too. Um, so I actually have used that RNN in the uh, other project as well. Uh, it was the project that 
you know, you just identify the functions in the binary file. So for the a Windows P file, for example, and and if you you know do the recursive um, you know passing of the all the functions, it, it takes a long time. Um, and uh, if you, you do the heuristics, uh, it also it's not accurate all the time either. So and the idea was that to identify all the functions uh, in the file automatically using the RNN, and it was you're working um, to some degree, but it, it, it's not working in in other cases because. The input symbol is just only the bytes, right? Has an input to the RNN in the particular scenario, and the uh, the one one the one single input can have two meanings, and you are assigning one single label <laughs> on that, then uh, and the model gets confused. So you have to think first whether you know. Uh, as a human being, if, if, if you get only that piece of information without any other you know, piece of knowledge, would you be able to tell the difference between this and that first? And if you can't do that, you, you can't expect the model to do that either, right? So, um, and you, you can use the RNN for any kind of sequence, but again, as I said before, you know, the, the length of the sequence becomes really long, then it, it may not work that well. So what, the, what, what we have in the trend these days in the uh, in deep learning space is so that we we focus more on the on the CNN side because it's it's really fast to the training these days. So I think I think we got you know more you know, more and more um, more research is uh, being done on the CNN side. But at the same time, I think RNN is still very useful and efficient for a uh, you know if the sequence size is is small enough. You're welcome. 因为时间的关系，我们等一下有还有问题的朋友可以再等一下来到前面再问讲师问题。Okay, so due to the long time limitation, so uh, let's uh, give us the, the clap on. Uh, Thank you so much. Speaker. Thank you.